The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux, read by Christopher Lee. It was the evening on which Monsieur de Bienne and Poligny, the managers of the Paris Opera, were giving a last gala performance to mark their retirement. Suddenly, the dressing room of La Sorelli, one of the principal dancers, was invaded by half a dozen young ladies of the ballet. Sorelli looked round angrily as little Jeanne, the girl with the tip-tilted nose, exclaimed in a trembling voice, It's the ghost! And she locked the door. Sorelli shuddered when she heard little Jam speak of the ghost, called her a silly little fool, and then, as she was the first to believe in ghosts in general, and the opera ghost in particular, at once asked for details. Have you seen him? As plainly as I see you now, said little Jam, whose legs were giving way beneath her, and she dropped with a moan into a chair. Thereupon little Giri added, If that's the ghost, he's very ugly. Oh, yes! cried the chorus of ballet girls, and they all began to talk together. The ghost had appeared to them in the shape of a gentleman in dress clothes, who had suddenly stood before them in the passage, without their knowing where he came from. He seemed to have come straight through the wall. Pooh! said one of them, who had more or less kept her head. You see the ghost everywhere! And it was true. For several months... There had been nothing discussed at the opera but this ghost in dress clothes who stalked about the building from top to bottom like a shadow, who spoke to nobody, to whom nobody dared speak, and who vanished as soon as he was seen. Yet who had seen him? You meet so many men in dress clothes at the opera who are not ghosts. But this dress suit had a peculiarity of its own. It covered a skeleton. At least so the ballet girls said. And it had a death's Head. The idea of the skeleton came from the description of the ghost given by Joseph Buguet, the chief scene shifter who had really seen the ghost. He had run up against the ghost on the little staircase by the footlights which leads to the cellars. He had seen him for a second, for the ghost had fled, and to anyone who cared to listen to him he said, He is extraordinarily thin, and his dress coat hangs on a skeleton frame. His eyes are so deep that you can hardly see the fixed pupils. You just see two big black holes, as in a dead man's skull. His skin, which is stretched across his bones like a drumhead, a nasty yellow. His nose is so little that you can't see it, side face. And the absence of that nose is a horrible thing to look at. All the hair he has... His three or four long, dark locks on his forehead and behind his ears. Sensible men said that Joseph Buquet had been the victim of a joke played by one of his assistants, and then there came an incident so curious and so inexplicable that the very shrewdest people began to feel uneasy. A fireman named Pompin, who had gone to make a round of inspection in the cellars, suddenly reappeared on the stage, pale and trembling, he had seen a head of fire without a body coming towards him. After that, could anyone be sure? The corps de ballet was flung into consternation. It's the ghost, little Jeanne cried. Listen. Everybody seemed to hear a rustling outside the door. There was no sound of footsteps. It was like light silk sliding over the panel, and then it stopped. Sorelli tried to show more pluck than the others. She went up to the door and in a quavering voice asked, Is there anyone behind the door? Oh, yes, of course there is, cried little Meg Giri, holding Sorelli back. Of course, whatever you do, don't open the door. But Sorelli turned the key and threw open the door, while the ballet girls retreated to the inner dressing room. Sorelli looked into the passage bravely. It was empty. A gas flame cast a red light into the surrounding darkness without succeeding in dispelling it. The dancer slammed the door with a deep sigh. Come, children, pull yourselves together. 
I dare say no one has ever seen the ghost. Yes, 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 yes. We saw him. We saw him just now, cried the girls. He had his death's head and his dress coat just as when he appeared to Joseph Piquet. Joseph Piquet would do better to hold his tongue. That's Mother's opinion, replied Meg. Mother says the ghost doesn't like being talked about. And why does your mother say so? I swore not to tell, gasped Meg. But they promised to keep the secret, until Meg, burning to say all she knew, began with her eyes fixed on the door. Well, it's because of the private box. What private box? The ghost's box, said Meg. It's, it's box five, you know, the box on the grand tier next to the stage box on the left. Oh, nonsense. I tell you it is. Mother has charge of it. No one has had it for over a month except the ghost. And orders have been given at the box office that it must never be sold. And does the ghost really come there? Yes. Then somebody does come. Oh, why, no. The ghost comes, but there's nobody there. The ballet girls exchanged glances. If the ghost came to the box, he must be seen, because he wore a dress coat and a death's head. This was what they tried to make Meg understand, but she replied, That's just it. The ghost is not seen, and he had no dress coat and no head. All they talk about the death's head, his head of fire. It's nonsense. You only hear him when he's in the box. Mother has never seen him, but she's heard him. Mother knows. "'because she gives him his programme. "'Thereupon little Shiri began to cry. "'I ought to have held my tongue if, if, if Mother ever came to know. "'Joseph Bouquet had no business to talk of things that don't concern him. "'It, it, it will bring bad luck. Mother was saying so last night.' "'There was a sound of hurried footsteps in the passage, "'and a breathless voice cried, "'Cecile! Cecile! Are you there?' "'It's Mother's voice!' cried Jeanne. "'What's the matter?' She opened the door. A plump lady burst into the dressing-room and dropped groaning into a vacant chair. "'How awful!' she said. "'Joseph Piquet is dead. "'He was found hanging in the third-floor cellar. "'It's the ghost!' little Giri blurted. All around her, her panic-stricken companions repeated under their breaths, Yes, yes, it must be the ghost. The horrid news soon spread all over the opera, where Joseph Buquet was very popular. The dressing rooms emptied, and the ballet girls, crowding around Sorelli like timid sheep around their shepherdess, made for the foyer through the ill-lit passages and stairways. On the first landing... Sorelli ran against the Comte de Chagny, who was coming upstairs. The Count, who was generally so calm, seemed greatly excited. I was just going to you, he said, taking off his hat. Oh, Sorelli, what an evening! And Christine Day, what a triumph! Impossible, said Meg Giri. Six months ago she used to sing like a crock. But, but, but do let us get by, my dear Count. We're going to inquire after a poor man who was found hanging by the neck. Just then the acting manager came fussing past and stopped when he heard this remark. What? he exclaimed roughly. Have you girls heard already? Well, above all, don't let Monsieur de Bienne and Monsieur Poligny hear. It would upset them too much on their last day. They all went on to the foyer of the ballet, which was already full of people. The Comte de Chagny was right. No gala performance ever equaled this one. All the great composers of the day had conducted their own works in turn. Faure and Krauss had sung, and on that evening Christine Day had revealed her true self for the first time to the astonished and enthusiastic audience. She had begun by singing a few passages from Romeo and Juliet. Those who heard her say that her voice in the passages was seraphic.